Good morning, almost afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, we're gonna get started here. Um, I'm Tanya Justin. I'm from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and the National Research Center for Distance Education and Technological Advancements. That's a really mouthful, big mouthful, um, but we just call it the Data Research Center. And I'm here with my colleague, Kate. Hi, and I have Kate cold. doesn't have a voice. <laughs> <laughs> My voice is a little shaky. Um, I'm Kate Lee McCarthy. I'm the director of both grants and finance for our online learning consortium. And uh, we've partnered on this for the Every Learner Everywhere Network. Great, thank you. Um, so I hope you can all hear us. We're also being webcast today. We'd like to do this a little bit more interactive. So as you have questions, if you wanna raise your hand, um, our friend Jim in the back is going to be walking around with a microphone as we go. And so to kick us off, Kate's gonna talk a little bit about um, the background of what is the Every Learner Everywhere Network and sort of what we're doing here today. Okay. So what is Every Learner Everywhere? Does anyone, has anyone heard about it? The network, okay, great. Um, so Every Learner Everywhere is a network of uh, partnered organizations. There are 12 of us, although there are really more than 12 um, because we partner with others. Um, and it's to bring together um, all these different organizations to help uh, colleges and universities navigate uh, digital learning, and specifically with a focus on adaptive technology um, and with a focus in equity. So. Um, you can see these are some of the organizations, these are the main ones, and then we uh, will work with other organizations to kind of work together. As part of this, uh, there are six main areas of Every Learner Everywhere, and Online Learning Consortium has been tasked with the digital learning innovations uh, arena. And so that is what we are here for today. Um, we are a working group and advisory committee comprised of a direct network partners, um, Digital Promise, D-Learn, APLU, ATD, and external partners. Um, some of those that you'll hear today, institution administration volunteers, um, and some of those are from Norfolk State, Southwest Tennessee Community College, and the University of St. Thomas. I'm kind of shortening things a little because of my voice, <laughs> so if, if you have any questions, please just let us know. So one of the first things that we thought of as part of this digital learning innovations area is how do we define innovations? Um, and so what we thought were the best steps to define them is to identify trends and gaps in digital learning and adaptive technology, um, and then to identify opportunities to utilize and or address those trends and gaps. And from there, we need to determine if they're scalable. Um, so the first step in this process was to, was to work with Tanya and her team um, and to devise and develop an environmental scan of digital learning innovations trends. So I'm gonna give it to Tanya from this point. Thanks. So this is a little bit of a different environmental scan. I think a lot of times we do environmental scans, they're very superficial. And I think when we're talking about identifying trends, obviously research is my strong point, and I'm a social scientist by trade, I wanted to actually do a more formal data collection to truly better understand what were the trends were. I've done lots of keynote talks just based off of, uh, from a social scientific perspective, um, you know, as sort of my gut feeling, what are the trends that I'm seeing nationally or internationally. But this one I wanted to be a little bit more thorough in understanding what exactly is out there, what is published, what are people working on, you know, key players and, and those sorts of things. And so what I call this is sort of an adapted um, environmental scan. The Data Research Center and OLC have been working together for actually several years. Um, originally, OLC, as many of you might remember, received a large grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates um, Foundation in order to explore digital learning innovations. And it was the award program that they had from 2016 through 2018. Where folks, um, is anyone here a DLI award winner? Nope, okay. So this is where folks from all over the country, there were over 200 submissions over the years, um, submitted proposals more or less asserting that their innovation on their campus was worthy of an award. 
I got super excited because I saw it as sort of 200 plus little mini case studies of innovation um, that we sort of got in this data set that it would be very hard to just collect this data nationally and actually have um, an understanding of innovation across the country or what universities and campuses felt was innovation. So what we ended up after three years, and we analyzed the data each year, but after three years, we ended up with over 1,000 pages of qualitative data. And so this wasn't just a gut instinct. This was actually a content analysis of 1,000 pages of data to identify some of the trends. And originally, it was not just trends for digital learning innovation, but we wanted to know all sorts of things about the organization, about the phase in which they're implementing the innovation, about um, the type of innovation, the implementation process, and so forth. And so that was just one piece of this environmental scan, was taking that 1,000 plus pages of qualitative data and the analysis from that, and looking at how that as one factor fits into um, to this digital trends I'm going to talk about. The other piece of it, as I mentioned, is that we wanted to um, understand the different pockets of innovation um, in the country. So we did focus on post-secondary education um, within the U.S. because that is the funding and where we're looking to push the needle on learning and success for students. And so what we did is we identified industry leaders, national organizations that were advancing technology and learning. So like OLC, there's lots of other organizations. We have EDUCAUSE, WCET, UPSIA, and so forth. We also looked at prominent research centers. Research centers seem to be a little bit of a theme popping up in the last few years. Data is one of them. We also know George Siemens Group out of U, um, University of Texas Arlington um, with the Link Lab. We also have uh, Barbara Means who left SRI and her and Vanessa have now moved to Digital Promise. We have the University of Central Florida Research of Instructional and Teaching Effectiveness. We know out of Oregon State eCampus, um, they also have a research center headed up by Katie Linder, so we included those. We also wanted to look at popular sort of news and media outlets, right? So a lot of us pay attention to the Chronicle of Higher Ed, Inside Higher Ed, and then um, I also wanted to make sure that we were looking at the actual peer-reviewed research, which I'll mention is a little bit problematic for an array of reasons, but we actually identified top journals in the field and, um, and examined those as well. So some of these journals include, obviously, the Online Learning Journal by OLC, but we also looked at the Internet and Higher Ed, uh, Distance Education, um, the Journal of Education and Technology, um, the International um, Research on Open and Distributed Learning, and, and so forth, to name a few of them. We also wanted to look at funded initiatives, other key institutions, vendors and products of interest, and just other key publications from national organizations. You know, um, Babson Group puts out reports. Um, we know the Holland IQ report came out and so forth. So more or less, what ended up is we pulled from all of these resources I've just listed for 18 months, starting with January 1st of 2018, actually a little over 18 months, till September 1st of 2019. And at the end, we had 400 articles and pieces of documents that we included in the analysis. So if something's gonna be rigorous, it will be this. <laughs> And, you know, it's funny, you expect some uh, really groundbreaking stuff, and I'll be honest with you, a lot of these things um, we've heard before, um, they're not new trends, but I think what you'll find is new is when I tell you why they are trends. All right. So what I call these are the primary trends in digital learning and innovation, and as we talk about the primary trends It'll be more or less that they were very prevalent in the DLI award submission data, as well as peer review and or news and media or other sources. And so the first one will be no surprise to you, but the first one um, is adaptive learning. And so most of us, how many of you are working here on initiatives on adaptive learning? One, two, three, four, five, about five of you? Okay, awesome. So adaptive learning is sort of an umbrella term. It can mean a lot of things, but pretty much we know that students are provided with learning activities. 
they're given some sort of assessment of their learning and base, and they're given feedback on that learning, uh, weaknesses and strengths, and based on the performance on that assessment, they're provided some sort of a pathway, or based on their level of achievement, they're provided an adaptive pathway um, that personalizes their strengths or weaknesses demonstrated on the assessment to move them forward. And some examples of that include Realize It. Um, I see my colleague Nicole Weber here from Wisconsin Whitewater. They're piloting that. Alex um, from McGraw-Hill Education is another one. A popular one in the DLI awards was Bio Beyond. Um, and another one which is very different is Smart Sparrow. Um, so all of these fall under the umbrella of adaptive learning, but we, as we, you know, we all know, Alex um, math pro well, predominantly math product is very different from Smart Sparrow. Yet they model the same concept when we were talking about adaptive learning, although I'm sure um, the leaders of both of those products would love to duke it out on how similar or different they are, probably how different they are. Um, so we had several award winners in the last year. Obviously, many of us are aware of um, Arizona State um, University using Alex to transform their college algebra. We also have University of Central Florida right here in the backyard of the conference that's been using uh, Realize It at their university with some success and also partnering with Colorado Technical Institute and some of the research they're doing. And there's others as well, Georgia State University, Ivy Tech Community College, Mojave Community College, to name a few. The interesting thing about adaptive learning, though, is we have very little research that's out there, and it hasn't really been that popular in our news and media. Um, and so that, to me, was really, um, was really, like I said, adaptive learning as a trend I don't think is anything that's quite new, as we've seen um, other initiatives talk about adaptive learning as a trend. But I think what is new is the fact that there's pockets of innovation happening at universities across the country, but we're not seeing it in the news, and we're not seeing any or very little published research. Out of the articles that we reviewed, uh, Chuck Zubins um, and Patsy Moskal, my colleagues from the University of Central Florida, had one of the few um, research or um, peer-reviewed research articles that are published in online learning journal. There's also a book out by Saba and Shear called Transactional Distance. You remember Michael Moore's work on transactional distance? Um, it's called Transactional Distance and Adaptive Learning, uh, Planning for Future of Higher Ed. So that one is out there as well. So anyways, I just thought that was really interesting for adaptive learning that we're not seeing a more peer-reviewed research out there. And it's definitely not something that's popular in the news. The next trend that we came out with, which is one I'm sure you've heard about, which is open education resources um, and the use of those. Now, OER can be course content or material or activities that are open, meaning anybody can use them. Um, usually they're free, but sometimes there might be a small charge. You know, obviously the push was for this is because we're looking to lower cost for students. Um, and we wanted alternative to textbooks because we didn't want the large price of textbooks um, pushing out um, students, you know, from taking courses. And so we were looking for textbook alternatives. Personally, our first OER initiative we led was years ago. I've been using our OER for almost 20 years in some of the online classes that I teach. Um, however, it's really gaining in its popularity and it became a trend. Some of the repositories, I'm sure, how many of you are using OER? See, there we go. So lots of people using OER, um, more than are using our adaptives. We have OpenStax, Merlot, which is obviously a partner of the OLC Innovate Conference. We have OER Commons. Um, some of the ways that the courseware that people are using to push out OER is Pressbooks, and I just learned about Equella. I'm not an OER expert, but at the same time, we're still just using sort of off-the-shelf uh, work productivity tools like Google Docs, Google Drive, WordPress, Adobe DC or Adobe PDFs, and, and those sorts of things. And so OER, again, is a prominent solution, but the key to OER is not just reducing costs. What we found out is that it actually can be of higher quality than what is being produced by publishers. It can be more relevant and current and it can be richer. We also are able to provide it to students earlier. So we're actually seeing it move the needle. There were several, again, DLI award winners um, from the last few years, but last year we had Salt Lake Community College, we had Bay Path University, um, and some other, a long list of others that were using it. 
This is probably the most mentioned in the news and media. So inside higher ed loves to talk about OER. Um, we know about different um, initiatives that are out there. There was recently a Babson report that was put out by Jeff Seaman and Elaine Allen and others about um, uh, changes in online enrollments and how OER is involved. We also have 2.2 uh, million students using OpenStax and Lumen Learning hits the 100,000 mark. So this is something that's already here that people are using. Um, we see the pockets of innovation in the award submissions. We can see it right here in this room. Now, many of you were probably at Open Ed a couple weeks ago, and we saw as uh, David concluded that conference, and so it'll be very interesting to see where things go from here. Again, there were very limited amounts of peer-reviewed research in this area. There were a few articles um, that we saw in the International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning. But a lot of the research that we're seeing out there is just about um, OER in general and saving money and or OER as it relates to MOOCs. We have to do, and sorry, this is just me putting on several hats and getting on a soapbox, but we have to do better at producing peer-reviewed research that shows that we're actually moving the needle on student outcomes. So just a little plea there. Uh, but there is um, a couple articles out there. Also, there's one in the internet and higher education and, and so forth. So um, a little bit more out there than adaptive learning, but not much, but definitely popular in this room and, and popular in the media. The next one, again, which isn't new, is gamification and game-based learning. Um, this one is an interesting trend. We um, had one award winner from um, Bozier. Am I saying that right, Bozier? I, been learning French, so now I want to say it differently. <laughs> Ma française est terrible, just so you know, I'm not doing good at learning French. Um, but Bozier Parish Community College was one of the, uh, the winners in that area. Um, there's a substantial amount of research in this area. We tried to limit it, obviously, to post-secondary education, but as we all know in this room, um, game-based learning and gamification is very popular just because of the societal implications of the use of games. So computers and education has a ton, online learning journal has a few, um, and again when we talk about gamification and game-based learning, um, by gamification we're talking about the, uh, the integration or incorporation of game elements um, so, you know, having a score, having somebody winning and badges and those sorts of things or earning points, um, sort of gamifying the learning experience. Game-based learning is, um, for example, I use SimCity to um, help my students better understand systems theory in relation to organizations. So actually incorporating a game for students to um, learn is um, an example of game-based learning. So there's lots of things out there and lots of games. Now, games are not new. Games have been around for centuries. Games and learning are not new. In some disciplines, we've been using simulations, which are game-like, for decades. And so, however, you know, this is definitely draws the attention of uh, peer-reviewed uh, researchers that are still trying to figure out how we can one, to share research on games. I think a lot of us are still trying to figure out how we can use games in our classes and incorporate them. Not a lot of us are game desires, so it becomes a little bit more of a challenge. Um, but I thought that shared that one. Oh, and I have Roblox up here because um, I was uh, reading Stephen, or who was it? Stephen Johnson um, gave a keynote at Educause a few weeks ago. I was talking about paying attention to the younger generations. I don't know how many of you have kids that play Roblox? A few of you? So in Roblox, I'm boss mommy. I play with my 11-year-old. Um, she thinks it's amazing. We are building um, some new houses. You could come by our neighborhood and check them out. Um, but we have a generation of children that are um, doing amazing things, graphic design, 3D building and modeling. Um, in virtual worlds that are going to be entering our institutions. So I think the research is warranted as a trend. The next one we have is MOOCs. Whew. I don't know why we cannot get rid of MOOCs, um, but they keep sticking around. I think I spent 18 months um, trying to convince my university that um, massively open online courses were not part or in line with our strategic plan for our university. Nicole is nodding her head because she was a part of that group. 
um, where they were insisting we had to get on that PR train and do a MOOC. I definitely think that MOOCs have a place um, in the world. I don't think it's necessarily in educating post-secondary um, four-credit students, which I think we figured out already. But again, here we see, um, and this is compliments of uh, Phil Hill and the work at eLiterate, um, where he was talking, uh, the image uh, uh, relates to that. We still see a significant amount of research with MOOCs. Um, again, I give it a trend because there is so much research. There is a huge amount of research in the International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning. A lot of that research tends to be around student motivation to take MOOCs. What I think would be more, and I would say before I get to that point, the other thing about MOOCs is student motivation or learner motivation um, and why people take MOOCs. I think also MOOCs um, have easy access to large data sources. So in regards to data science and learning analytics um, and new methodologies that we can use for that, it's exciting. What I would really like us to do more of if we're gonna be doing research with MOOC data is student and instructor behaviors. But as we know, a lot of these are C MOOCs or content driven MOOCs. And so they don't really have data around meaningful interactions that are that exciting. Um, but we had journals or articles in online learning journal and the internet and higher ed um, and, and so forth on MOOCs. So there's still a, tr a significant amount of research out there. Um, obviously, George Siemens, who I think has been called like, I don't know, the godfather of MOOCs or so forth. Um, you know, he had the connectivistic MOOCs and that work. Um, and actually, Bill and Melinda Gates um, Foundation had um, funded some of his work. We also had a MOOC conference in 2012 where they got four inches of ice and snow in um, Arlington, Texas. We were snowed in there for a very long time. Uh, good memories. Um, but if you go to the Link Lab at UTA, you could see a lot of the research there as well. There's also a few conferences that tend to focus on that research. Some of you may be familiar with the Learning Analytics Knowledge um, conference in solar. Um, the LAC conference this year will be in Frankfurt, Germany, I believe. So this one's very interesting, the LMS, right? Ten years ago, I wrote a blog post on the future of LMS because there was this huge sort of thing like, we're all leaving the LMS in droves. Okay, we're not leaving the LMS. <laughs> Ten years later, I actually had predicted we would just have the LMS. It just would have better interoperability with the hundreds of different applications. And, um, you know, that's sort of where we are with the LMS. As much as some of us would like to further democratize access to education by getting rid of the LMS, students actually, data shows that they like the LMS. Um, they like having everything in one place. Um, they like the consistency of the experience among courses. And so it does uh, still come up as a trend. Several of the DLI award winners, including University of Florida and Bay Path and Mal Norfolk State, all talked about how integral the LMS was um, to their effort. Um, again, thanks to Phil Hill and eLiterate, um, this is something that they update every year and it's the market share. We could see because of the Unison initiative that Canvas has gotten quite bigger, including in the state of Wisconsin. The other thing about this as well is not just as the interoperability of the LMS and the fact that it still has some staying power, power make it a trend. We also still see a significant amount of research, especially in the online learn journal, about different functionalities with the, within the LMS, you know. Honestly, I think we're still trying to figure out how to use asynchronous discussions effectively. We know that students want to interact with the instructor and they want to interact with each other, um, but it's a little hard to make that happen. And it's um, sometimes hard for instructors to understand how to structure those and um, what our role is. But they talk a lot in uh, research still about um, not only the asynchronous discussions, but also group functions, checklist functions, how to use assessment tools effectively. All of this is current research from the last 18 months. So as much as we might want to the LMS to go away, it's, it's not going anywhere. Another uh, priority trend we saw again was mobile learning. Of, of course, um, you know, such a huge percentage, 99% of us have smartphones and use it for learning. 
this actually came up not as per se awards about mobile learning. And again, we've been doing mobile learning initiatives at my university for a decade at least. Uh, but it really more came up as a theme about every innovation. We saw a crossover theme, you know, using it in the LMS or using students using it on a mobile device. So when we talk about digital courseware or digital innovation, two definitely consider, you know, big considerations you should have is can this reside within my LMS through LTI interoperability or an API? And can my students access this seamlessly from a mobile device? Um, we saw over and over situations um, or examples of how mobile devices were so intrinsic to the student learning. There's also lots of reports. So Glo um, Goldie Blumenstick from the Chronicle um, had talked about the Learning House and Asian Market Research Report. Um, she also had another one that talks about um, a second one that she had about what do online students want and them just talking more about being able to access and do work on their phones. Uh, mobile learning was also a trend. How many of you are familiar with the, what previously was the new medium consortium horizon report and now is the Educause horizon report? Okay, so this was on the 2019 horizon report that was put out by um, Malcolm Brown and Nori uh, Brahas Murphy. Again, the couple that talked about mobile specifically in the DLI awards, which are available on the OLC website, was Norfolk Stake and Bozier Parish. Um, and again, there's um, you know a huge number of articles. One you might want to pay attention to is in the Internal Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning from Cross, Sharpless, Healing, and Ellis. So we're not seeing a huge amount of specific um, activities developed for mobile learning like we did years ago. You know how we were all out like geotagging stuff and QR codes were everywhere. Um, I don't think we're seeing as much about that and research about that, but definitely there's an expectation that it won't just be work on students' laptops. Everything we do has to work on their mobile device. I am super excited about this one. Um, any instructional designers in the room or people that oversee instructional design units? So some of us for a very long time, like 10, 20 years, have known even before we called it instructional design that there was something about how we structured the course and the interactions within it that made it very important to student learning. Um, on the screen in front of you, my favorite is Wigan Teague's Backward um, Design. They have a book called Understanding by Design. This became core in our faculty development program for online and blended uh, teaching and learning. On the right is actually the model by Garrison, which has also been um, talked about with more and so forth, is that students have three interactions in a blended and online class. Their interaction with content, their interaction with each other, and the interaction with instructor. And so these are things that we all pay attention to design. I was really excited in our analysis of this year's DLI awards and looking at previous years. This year, design really mattered. We started hearing people talk more and more. Before, it was just the technology and the students or things like that. And this year, it was really about implementation, was the course designed properly, how they integrated and or implemented the courseware within the design, how the design changed. There's other methods out there I know Addie has been mentioned before. So design is very important. We also see this, some of you might not be aware, but um, the Malcolm Brown from Educause already emailed out what the trends were gonna be for the Horizon Report for 2020 and design is one of those, or the elevated focus on design. And he's looking for examples. So uh, jump on the ELI listserv if you have some examples of that. I also want to bring out the fact that not only is design important, course design, instructional design, as some of you who was at the Learning Design Summit or Instructional Design Summit on Wednesday, a few of you, yeah, the role of the instructional designer um, is emerging and changing years ago at the OLC blended conference in Denver, we had an unconference and out of nowhere, like 75% of the room was instructional designers. When I started doing this 20 years ago, instructional designers weren't a thing. 
Um, and so this is definitely an emerging re role. The pathway of an instructional designer is of interest of, to researchers as well, or the career pathway. Also, um, Ellen Wagner is working with IEEE and something called Learning Engineers, if some of you are in those conversations. And then we have new types of research, right? User design research focused on satisfaction of an experience and how that impacts design and also learning experience design. Um, my friend and colleague, Jess Knott from Michigan State, wrote a section for the new upcoming Data Research Toolkit 2.0, um, which has a whole section including research in this area. And so anyways, design. Woohoo! Super excited. Um, and that also ties into our need for faculty uh, development and professional development and, and all of those sorts of things. All right. The next section, so those were things um, that I just talked about which were prevalent. They were either prevalent in the pockets of innovation we're seeing across this country that are being piloted and tested. They're prevalent either in news and media or other um, sources of innovation, of information around innovation, or we're seeing lots of research. These are things that I call secondary trends in which they definitely um, deserve um, some recognition. Some of them are a little bit surprising. Um, and so the first one comes from blended. Um, I love blended learning. We started doing blended learning in 2001. I personally am biased. I think it's the best sort of learning that's out there if folks are able to come face to face at all. But it's also probably one of the hardest pedagogical models to implement. And in the 2018 DLI Awards, in particular in the STEM areas, we started to hear a lot more mention about blended learning. Um, and blended learning of online labs and just blended learning of online and face-to-face. -face. So some of the disciplines where online has been a little difficult to make movement, we're seeing more movement in the area of blended. This also was on the Horizon Report for 2019. And we're also seeing pockets, again, of empirical research jump up in this area. And so I thought that it deserved a little bit of its own recognition. If I had millions of dollars, I would make this come back in all sorts of way for our country. And I'm gonna work on that. So if you're interested in working on it, reach out to me. Um, the next thing that we had on our list uh, was, I'm, I'm just gonna go with dashboards because we keep saying learning analytics and data and all of those sorts of things. But I think what's really innovative is the work that we're seeing um, at University of Central Florida and Arizona State, and this is actually from the University of Michigan. They're my learning analytics dashboard. And I really think that when we talk about dashboards, the student-facing analytics um, are the things that I think are most interesting that we're hearing about. The, um, LAC, again, is doing work in learning analytics and dashboards. The Link Research Lab is doing work in this area. Unison is obviously um, working with University of Michigan and others. This was on the EDUCAUSE Horizon Report uh, for last year. And so it also will be on the 2020 report. Um, they call it uh, Analytics for Student Success. So there's lots of different ways that people are using data. Um, to provide students information about their learning. Some of it is at the program level at the institution and some of it's at the course level. As far as the course level for faculty, I feel like I have been using data in my course for a long time to tell me about how my students are doing and how I can help them based on you know, what they're doing in the course, how they're doing on the assessments and those sorts of things. But I think we'll see a lot more in the area of student facing dashboards in the future. What we're missing from the analytics discussion and the data discussion is we're not capturing enough data. Again, this is just my personal hat. I'm getting on my soapbox. Um, our, techno our systems and the software developers are not capturing and or just in general, we're not capturing enough data about the behaviors of our students. And so I think we really need to be collecting more behavioral data about what our students are doing for how long, how they're interacting with each other and the instructors, and I think that would be most helpful. We do see a lot of research out there, um, not a lot, but we do see some out there in this area. Obviously, um, if you look through the LAC uh, proceedings, there's tons of stuff on learning analytics. The, um, again, the IRR ODL has stuff and the internet and higher education. But we're still, we're still just, um, I think, scraping the iceberg on this. 
The next one is virtual reality. I just say virtual reality. It's like I can't even remember. We like to clump things in. It's virtual reality. There's augmented reality. They're calling it mixed reality. Now there's XR. Um, there's lots of things going on with this, but there's not, you know, there's pockets of innovation, but again, just like with the student dashboards, there's not like scale across our country in um, virtual reality. Now, um, being that I am a scholar of communication technology, um, I was using Active wor Worlds in my class in 2001. I was a huge proponent of Second Life, and I'm still in that too, which is sadly how I got my Gmail name, Juice Gyoza. I didn't know Gmail was gonna be a thing, so it's actually my Second Life avatar's name if you ever have to Gmail me. Um, and so, you know, I think um, NMC and some others deserting uh, virtual reality, but folks internationally um, are doing a lot of work. I'm headed to Asia in a couple months to work more on augmented reality and virtual reality, but more or less we're mixing realities because we're able to capture data, 3D data, immersive data, and we can use it in of itself to integrate into our classes and or we can use it with, for example, a textbook that you can open up with your phone and um, hold your phone over a QR code and now have a 3D representation of a cell. So there's lots of things happening. I just don't view it's a major scalable trend. Again, these are on the New Horizon reports from last year and for next year. Shaping EDU is an effort out of Arizona State which captured the New Media Consortium community. They have it listed and there are things they're talking about and there's research, a lot of research in computers and education. The next one is artificial intelligence. We like to mix this up with machine learning, but they're different things. So we can talk about machine learning as well. Um, again, these aren't things we're seeing widespread. Rand Corporation came out with a report that said the three core um, areas of teaching or challenges of teaching where we're seeing AI is intelligent tutoring systems, automated essay scoring, and early warning systems. Mainly we're seeing publishers put these into their tools. They are resource intensive to make happen. I don't, is anybody a faculty member in here writing AI code to incorporate? One person. So good for you. Uh, we don't see a lot of faculty that are writing AI to incorporate. The coolest thing I've seen about AI lately is a company called Soul Machines um, out of, I'm gonna say Australia, but it's probably totally New Zealand. I just met them at Educause and they're taking the technology they used in the movie Avatar and they're making 3D um, soul machines, is what they call them, that actually can sense your nonverbals through video and they can um, communicate with you through conversational scripts. So they're sort of like the next step to chatbots. We all know chatbots are run by AI, but still looking for more meaningful ways that that's enhancing in the, in the class um, learning and is going to move the needle for us. And then there, that's, those are the main ones that I came up with the, with the research. Again, we have um, over 400 documents and 1,000 pages of qualitative data. So as Kate knows, I keep every day rereading hundreds of pages and coming up with some other things. But I felt that these final ones were just honorable mentions. And so um, there's a long list of them here. Some of these are features of technology, some of these are technologies, some of these things are just related processes um, related to um, digital learning innovations that I felt needed to be discussed. And I'm not going to talk about any of them here, but I should let you know that um, when Kate releases um, the full report, they'll be available in there in, in a little bit more detail, but not much. But I'm willing to talk about any of these things with you. All right, and so next steps um, for every learner. Um, so what we're going to do is take this information, develop a seed grant program, looking for- uh, Money for you. Yeah. <laughs> it's small, they're small grants, very small grant amounts, but the, but the point would be to bring you into the network, um, develop pilots, and uh, potentially pilot some of these ideas and innovations. Uh, another uh, action that we are taking is a faculty action research stipend. We're actually doing a pilot of it uh, with the Lighthouse institutions that are part of our network, um, and that will be uh, reviewing um, 
how faculty uh, utilizes dashboards and adapt and analytics in their um, understanding of behavior. Um, and one of the last things that we are working on is, an, is a national uh, STEM survey on the state of online education in STEM um, to identify what's going on there and if and why it's lagging behind potentially becoming um, a fully online program or group of programs. So. And I should mention quick, I, I already just shared these right before we started on my slideshare.net slash tjustin. Um, so you can go ahead and grab the slides on there and I tweeted them out as well um, at tjustin. Um, so twitter.com slash tjustin or slideshare.net tjustin slash tjustin. You get it. So there's my contact information and more about uh, getting a hold of me. And here's more about getting a hold of Kate and understanding more about the Every Learner Everywhere network. But if you're doing really great innovative things, please keep an eye open um, for the seed grant money that Kate will be announcing in the near future. And we have about five minutes for any questions. Um, and I'll be available after if anybody just wants to talk. I can't even read Thank that you. sign, Jim. Sorry. Okay, that's. Our, I have a couple questions. First oh, okay. of all, could you? Uh, could I'm you like you can wave paper at me all you want. Okay. I have no clue. Could you? First of all, could you repeat, please, the LXD written resource, the one that you talked about from MSU? Yeah. So um, the my data research center, dataresearch.org, we put out in 2015 as part of our FIPSI funded 1.48 million dollar effort. Um, a data research toolkit that helps people um, conduct research at their course or their institution um, on various things. We had a list of research questions. We had a guide to experimental design. We have a student instrument packet with over 50 student surveys. We have data code books and so forth. Um, it's been downloaded by over 1,000 people in every state of the U.S. and over 25 countries. That was a really big shameless plug. But go get it if you want to do research. It's awesome. We're working on a new one. We're also looking for funded, be funding because we haven't had time to get it finished. But in the new data research toolkit, which will be coming out in 2019, we have a section on how to do um, learner-centered um, research or uh, learner design research, excuse me. Right. So and if what, you want to reach out to me through the website or through my connection, I can get you that information. Just not at Michigan State, who is the head of LX Research, wrote the piece for us. All right, and then we have one more a comment. I'm, surpri I'm surprised to see micro-credentials buried, as Honor Rule mentions. Could right. she say a little bit more about that? It's a popular notion for yeah. university administrators. Yeah, it is. Yeah, well, right there is your answer. It's popular among university administrators and not many other people. Um, I've spent the last 18 months helping develop a new arm of my university for workforce development and upskilling. A lot of that is around obviously micro credentials, uh, modularized learning, in particular for corporate partnerships. If you went to um, ASU GSV, everyone's an OPM, everyone is doing workforce development, but there's absolutely no peer-reviewed research on it. It's very seldomly talked about in the news and media. Um, it was, um, a, and I guess it could be maybe one up. There was um, a little bit of a theme in the Chronicle, um, but in general, it's not, it's, you know, it's sort of, it, everybody gets excited about it because it's new and potentially a new business model, but it's actually probably less than 10% of the conversation when it comes to teaching and learning. And again, these were about digital learning innovations, pushing the needle on undergraduate students. So um, the focus is some, this is, I'm not trying to, this is not a prediction. This is based on data gathered. Um, and it was really about, you know, what sorts of things can we do to help all of our students have access to and be successful in their post-secondary education. Sorry, that was a super, I love just making really long answers longer. <laughs> Any other questions from anybody here? We've got one minute. <laughs> All right, well with that, I just wanted to thank you all very much for coming um, and hanging out with us. Uh, 
you know, at the end of the day here, now we've, we've taken you into the afternoon. I'm really excited about this work and all of the data that we have as we um, continue to weed through it. So if you have any questions or input um, or advice, please feel free to reach out to me via email or Twitter. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.